Just like yesterday, we are going to start by reciting Namo Dasa three times. <clears throat> Namo Dasa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambuddhasa. Namo Dasa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambuddhasa. Namo Dasa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambuddhasa. <clears throat> Uh, <clears throat> today is the second lecture of Introducing Buddhism series of the uh, Buddhist Society in London. And <clears throat> today the topic I'm going to discuss is, uh, as you have seen on the website, um, the three signs and three poisons, three signs and three poisons. Um, <clears throat> three signs, sometimes we call this three characteristics, three characteristics. Um, some people may be familiar with this in the name of three characteristics. Uh, some people use the, the word three signatures or three signs. Um, among the Buddhists, this is a well-known uh, set of teaching. Um, to other people, these three signs, um, maybe they are less familiar with. And even among the Buddhists, when we talk about the three signs, when they, re, when they hear the name, like impermanence, uh, suffering, and non-self, in Pali called Dilakana, and the three signs are impermanence and Nietzsche, and suffering Dukkha, um, and then non-self, anatta. Usually, people take it um, as being negative. As being negative, impermanence, they take it very negative, suffering even more so. Non-self, really non-self, no no self, no me, no you. Again, this is uh, something they take it very negatively. So today, I'd like to present to you that these three signs, this set of teaching, as we call three signs, three characteristics, is very positive. Very positive. And <clears throat> this is what I intend to <clears throat> to explain uh, throughout the lecture today. Uh, Sometimes <clears throat> sometime the word impermanence um, is considered only on negative light. Say, so for example, when something we hold dear to uh, vanishes, um, disappears, and people will remember impermanence, the teaching of impermanence. And this is all right, this is uh, the right way of reflecting on the situation. But that's only half of it. That's only half of it. When somebody is not well and that person recovers, that's also because of the law of impermanence. The sickness is impermanent. We, <clears throat> in this world, we have had many pandemics in the past. And each time, 
Okay. Um, we find something to um, to manage to uh, to deal with that. And some of the pandemics, you know, they disappear. So that's also the law of impermanence. We need to we need to remember the law of impermanence also when things change from bad to good and from good to better. Not just from good to bad. I'd like to emphasize this one. Then, <clears throat> um, in place of impermanence, uh, if we if we try to 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 see and to use another word, that is change and changeability. Change and changeability. Then maybe change is a little bit more. Um, objective and neutral in some people's mind. If that's the case, go for it. Go for the word change. In Pali, it's called Viparitama. Impermanent is called Anicca. Both are synonym. <clears throat> change and changeability. Okay. Even when we are dealing with change and changeability, we all react to change, the prospect of change, the reality of change in different ways, depending on our emotion. If something we like is going to change, then we get upset. Okay, we experience sorrow. But <clears throat> if you get bored, if you get bored, you want the situation to change because the change might, <clears throat> might bring something exciting. So not that we understand change objectively, but simply because we get fed up with something. We, are, we feel bored with something. That is why we welcome change. This happened in election, this happened um, in the environment. So sometimes people, okay, um, they let like you go on holiday because um, they feel stuffy being at home all the time. So they like to see something different, something new. There's nothing wrong to see something new, to learn from something new. But if we are propelled by, if we are pushed by boredom, actually we need to look at um, that negative emotion of boredom. So there are two sides of it. One is the negative emotion, which is boredom. Boredom is about rejection. It's about rejecting whatever you are doing at the present moment, whatever you are eating, you know, whoever you're with, whatever you're doing, wherever you are, you know. Boredom means rejecting, rejecting all of that. So in that instance, people usually welcome change not because they have an insight and understanding into the nature of chain, but because <clears throat> they just want to get rid of something. So they would say, welcome change. Other times, not because they get bored, but because they get angry, they get irritated. That is why they want to get rid of something. 
in that instance, also people would like to have change. Say in the election, <clears throat> if you feel aversion towards something, maybe government, maybe um, an elected officer, then with that negative emotion, you can't see the good thing in that person and you want to, to, <clears throat> to have a change. But the, the two reasons for change, the two reasons that um, um, many people usually welcome change, uh, that they are not part of, part of an understanding, objective understanding. The two, to recap it, one is boredom. Boredom pushes us to look for something, for a change. And the second thing is um, aversion or anger, dislike, whatever we want to call that, is emotional rejection. So that also um, pushes us to look for a change. But what the Buddha is saying, change is not that. And the Buddha is talking about what happens with, with our mind and body, with our life, and with anything outside, anything we see with our eyes, anything that we hear anything that we experience. So when we talk about change in this aspect, this can bring fear. Why fear? Because we fear of losing something. <clears throat> For example, if, if you look at me, okay, I would prefer, okay, a youthful face, not changing. Okay, I would prefer um, a strong and healthy body, never changing. And when I was young, I used to have a strong voice. And, and then at Oxford, just before I completed my PhD, I totally lost my voice. And I have regained it now to a certain extent. So I can see change, the process of change is always there. But when we say the process of change or the changeability, the possibility of change, we are not talking about being resigned uh, to the nature of change and and not doing anything about it. No, it's not about passive acceptance of the law of change, but it's about uh, understanding how change happens in day-to-day -day life, in our body, with ourselves, with molecule, with DNA, uh, with all that, changing minute by minute, second by second to understand that and then um, to train our minds so that we live with that change so that we don't fight with that change. The first thing. The second thing is so that the part of change that we can, we can do something about so that we do something about, so that change happens, okay, in the positive way. Our emotion changes all the time. Changes all the time. And people's opinions also change. So within that change and changeability, we talk about human effort 
that I touch upon when I talk about life of the Buddha yesterday, human effort. So we believe in human effort. Um, we believe in human effort. <clears throat> we believe in human effort so that, um, um, that we do something Um, so that so that we do something and 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 changes happen for the better. So the changes happen for the better. So this is all about the middle way or the noble four part that we are going to be talking about in the fourth lecture. It's about recognizing human effort. But human effort wouldn't make sense if we cannot change, if we cannot change things. Human effort wouldn't make sense. Human effort is meaningful only if things are changeable. We can change from ignorance to wisdom, um, from anger to compassion, from misunderstanding to understanding, um, uh, from blaming each other um, for the COVID-19 to understanding and collaboration. So we need this um, natural law of change and changeability. Um, to initiate uh, something. So basically, as a human being, we, we accept change partially. Or we want change, we are keen to have change, change and changeability. But when we think Change means facing something less familiar, an unfamiliar situation, then that triggers fear within us. Change in the workplace, if someone new coming in, joining the team, everybody has anxiety. Even the person who's coming also experiences anxiety until we get to know each other and we set it down. You can see um, change um, is often associated with anxiety. Only for people who want to get rid of something, then for them change um, may be associated with something hopeful. But as far as the Buddha is concerned, okay, as far as the Buddha is concerned, <clears throat> um, understanding change in the change and changeability in theory, that's not sufficient. We need to be observing mindfully, you know, with strong mindfulness how our emotion changes in real time on the spot. How our physical body changes in real time and on the spot. So this is reflection on what we call impermanence. The things are changing all the time. Okay, now when something changes, and something changes and we fear that we're going to lose something. We're going to fight with this change. We won't accept this change. And we, we, 
we we can't see the positive aspect of it that this change may bring something good and we have an opportunity um, to affect this change so fear that fear is suffering the second the second <clears throat> um, of the three signs when we talk about suffering i'm going to talk about this uh, explain this a little bit more tomorrow but um uh, the word suffering is um is not is not popular with anyone with buddhists or non-buddhists because um, if we have to study about suffering we do so because we want to get rid of it i mean living with suffering uh, is not um, something that we are keen with that, that we are keen to do as a human being this is where the enlightenment of the buddha comes in and we may find it very helpful the buddha says if we learn or if we know how to live with suffering maybe a lot of suffering won't happen the um, involuntary suffering something that we can't avoid it will happen i want to recall <clears throat> i want to refer to um, one um, a famous for, <clears throat> forest meditation master um, still living in Myanmar in Burma uh, he writes and he talks sometime but uh, he doesn't run retreats and, and something like that he lives in solitude most of the time and uh, his name is Mahabodhi Nyanxia. The way he puts it is like this. <clears throat> Involuntary suffering is only a quarter. One quarter. The three quarters are voluntary. Meaning, we don't, understand, we don't know how to live with that one quarter involuntary suffering. As a result, we multiply, we top up suffering. We top up suffering. Uh, let me give you an example. <clears throat> um, every now and then, okay, every few hours, this body, our body requires food. We get hungry. Uh, this is involuntary suffering. It doesn't matter what which religion you choose to follow or not at all you know it doesn't matter this is the nature of the physical body so every few hours we have to take care of this body with food and with drink if we are aware of this basics okay this basic requirement of the body and we will only um, we only take food that is agreeable to this body sometimes we don't do that we go after taste we go after the taste even if the the, the food <clears throat> doesn't agree with us, okay. Um, oftentimes, okay, we we go for it. We go for it, especially young people. What happened after that? Okay. Um, we have to go for the food that we crave. And we are blinded 
to any um, any danger that uh, the the food that we are after, you know, is supposed to have. Because we are not we are not looking at the food as um, as a nutriment, something uh, to reduce the suffering of hunger, suffering of malnutrition. Instead, we look at that as an enjoyment, sometimes more than an enjoyment, sometimes we look at it as a social status, a sign of social status. If we look at it as a sign of social status, now our psychology changes completely. So this is how we top up, how we top up um, a suffering. Suffering exists, but the unavoidable and involuntary suffering is quite manageable, according to this Mahatmyang Sierra. The three quarters, but this is not a rocket science, okay? This is just to, to tell you that our subconscious mind, our automatic mind, goes into spinning, and what it does, who knows? It increases pain and suffering. The only reason that the mind is doing that is because it doesn't know what suffering is and how to live with that. <clears throat> so if you are hungry, for example, this is my favorite um, example. If you are hungry, Give yourself one minute and observe that hunger, observe that suffering. Some people would argue with me. I mean, hunger, you're getting hungry. How could you call that suffering? The word suffering or dukkha simply means something difficult to bear with. Something difficult to bear, bear with. Okay. I mean, hunger is something difficult to bear with. When you, are, when you are hungry, what happens to you? You know, you become restless, um, you can even faint. It's not something easy to take. I mean, hunger, not easy. For a baby, they would scream straight away with hunger. But to Recognize and accept this hunger. It doesn't add you any pain. This is the magic of it. The magic of understanding pain. <clears throat> of course, I'll be talking a lot more about this um, um, tomorrow when I talk about the Four Noble Truths. Um, today, just to say that suffering is psychological as well as physical or physiological. And the point I'd like to make is that the majority of the sufferings are down to, down to us, not knowing how to, uh, how to, how to manage suffering. So in order to manage it, it's so important that we know it. In order to know it, it's so important that we go through it mindfully. If you get a headache, <clears throat> before you take a paracetamol, in some country, Panadol, okay, before you take that painkiller, if you just experience that, headache for one minute, for two minutes, you know, just breathe in and out nicely and experiencing that headache. And trying to see how subconscious mind is trying to take over, trying to dictate you to do this, to do that. To resist that pain, that suffering. I'm not asking you to to spend a whole day with headache, but just maybe, maybe one minute, two minutes. 
if you accept that pain, okay, it's okay to have this headache. It happens. Okay. You can tell yourself, um, you can comfort yourself, okay, later I'm going to take paracetamol. Now, for one minute, for two minutes, because Venerable Damasami suggests that um, we live with uh, the headache for one or two minutes, I'm, I'm going to try it. Just try it. Okay. In 2016, I, I broke my ankle in Singapore. So I had an operation and an implant. So for the first few days, you know, um, despite the painkiller, you, know, you, you would experience some pain, especially at night. And with slight move, slight movement of the feet, you you do experience pain and you wake up in the you know in the middle of the night so every one or two hours you just wake up um, during daytime intentionally i took only one third of the prescribed painkiller because i wanted to uh, to observe the pain, I wanted to know uh, how my subconscious habit, my reaction pattern is towards the pain, especially my subconscious habit. In simple terms, I, I wanted to take the opportunity to train myself to live with pain. So taking less painkiller means, okay, less damage to my Less, less burden to my, uh, my kidney as well. So I, I did that and it was a very uh, rewarding experience. In meditation, this is what we do. Whenever there, whenever there is physical discomfort, at the beginning, we refuse to, to live with that. Okay. We like to get rid of straight, get rid of it straight away. But with meditation advice that we get from our teachers, we learn how to observe it. Actually, when we observe the pain, that suffering of physical discomfort is quite bearable. At the beginning, ten minutes was just too long. But after I mean, too long means uh, not just physical discomfort, not just physical pain, but also psychological pain. We didn't know that those psychological pains were avoidable. We didn't know. But with good meditation advice, um, we persevere and we came to know that it's okay to have pain. It's okay. We accept it. We learn how to live with that. What happened? We can meditate for 45 minutes, for one hour, some people for two hours, three hours. And the physical pain doesn't bother them anymore. Of course, physiologically, not much has changed. Of course, today in, um, in, in very uh, advanced scientific era, you know, we can, we can talk about uh, neurological research and meditation. And when we resist um, the amygdala, the uh, all part of our brain works, and we spend more of our energy, um, the, the blood flow, the oxygen use is at um, is maximum. But when we accept, when we don't resist the pain and, and, and our brain changes you know, from old brain to new brain, to the frontal cortex, and as a result, Um, the flow of oxygen, the use of oxygen 
and um, and also the blood is less. So physiolog physiologically, we are not increasing, we are not topping it up. The pain, the original pain, the pain remain as uh, I mean at um, is original or manageable level. <clears throat> <clears throat> so, um, accepting pain, accepting pain can only do good to you. But accepting, it doesn't mean we are not doing anything about that. It doesn't mean that, <clears throat> that um, um, yeah, we can't do anything about that. Buddhist belief is not about fatalism, it's not about determinism. It's, it's about human effort that I, I talked about yesterday. So when we accept, when we accept suffering, this is part of the, the strategy, if you like, the strategy or the coping mechanism and it doesn't stop at that. After we have accepted suffering, we observe that closely. And when we observe something closely, understanding can only arise at that time. <clears throat> With close investigation and observation. Now, sometime um, suffering, like uh, earlier I was talking about, uh, the suffering of hunger, the suffering of physical discomfort. When, um, <clears throat> when we ask, hungry, we don't usually think about other people who are also hungry. No, we don't think about our neighbors who might also be getting hungry. Between 12 and um, between midday to 2 p.m., this is the time, I mean, <clears throat> Um, by habit, through habit, this is the way people in England um, get hungry. At that time, when we get hungry, we just want to, to stop working and go and grab some food. There's nothing wrong with that. But one thing that the Buddha advises us to do is that when you get hungry at that time, experience that hunger, maybe for a few minutes, for one minute, for two minutes, and think about other people who might be hungry. You know, in your office, your teamwork, maybe people outside, or people who who, who, who have no choice but to work during lunchtime, maybe news people, <laughs> news readers and, and um, police and, and you know, whoever. Think about them. If you think about them, then you come to see that suffering is a common feature of human life. Is, um, is common humanity, the word that I used yesterday. In that sense, in that aspect, suffering is not me, it's not, you know, it's not unique to me, it's me, but it's not unique to me. Okay, you experience hunger, but um, that hunger is not unique to you. In that sense, we say, 
there is no permanent self, meaning permanent anti uh, identity. Okay, is is a process of experience. Hunger is a process of experience. Physical discomfort is also a process of experience. They happen with conditions. They are conditioned. With this, I'm telling you that um, I interpret anatta. Um, to mean, okay, not just me, another, another, not just me. The temptation um, to see things as me as my is very strong in us because um, we all have to fend off for ourselves, everyone. It doesn't matter which political system a country you know, adopts. Um, those days, communism, now <clears throat> open democracy, um, we all have to stand on our own feet. So this, I mean, coming from the situation where we are totally dependent on our mother and now we have to take care of ourselves. This is a big leap and it creates excitement as much as anxiety. Young people, <clears throat> um, 18 years old, going to university, they all feel very excited. But once they reach university, they all cry because they miss home <clears throat> for the first few weeks. For the first few weeks. Um, at that moment, usually when students come to me, I ask them to talk to their friend who are in the same situation. When they see other people share their experience, the ex experience of being far from parent, from home, um, for the first time having to totally depend on themselves. When they see other people share that experience, actually their pain of being away from home is reduced. So anatta means this one. This is the, the third, the third sign is this one. is to counter against the tendency um, to personalize, to personalize uh, any, any experience as me and mine. Okay. Because once we have identified that as me, as mine, we are not going to let it go easily. We want to cling to that. Suppose if you cling to some form of disappointment, you don't see that um, disappointment is uh, quite common to people. At that moment, when you really feel disappointed, uh, it, it looks as if you are the only one, okay, being disappointed in the world, in the whole world. So that tendency to personalize, um, to look at things in a very fixed way and not share that experience with other people in theory, in practice, 
that's what we say, what that what we call ignorance or delusion. That delusion is one of the three, the three fires. Okay, the sermon of fire, <clears throat> the fire sermon um, of the Buddha. This is 2,600 years old. And soon after his enlightenment, the Buddha met um, a thousand ascetics who were, who were uh, fire worshippers. They worship fires. They were very good ascetics, very devout, very dedicated, very genuine in their practice. But the way they look at fire was the fire outside. Fire that you make and then you worship it. The Buddha reinterpreted fire for them. The Buddha said fire is actually um, psychological. Fire that is more dangerous to human being is psychological fire. One is delusion. Delusion that my pain, you don't understand, you don't share with this pain, you don't know, you don't have any pain, your life is all perfect, um, my life is uh, chaotic. We often have this, this notion. Sometimes when you have to, um, to tidy up, you know, a lot to tidy up at home, you feel you are the most, uh, you, you are the busiest person on earth. Okay, the busiest person on earth. That notion often comes to our mind. If that happens, uh, a tendency within us is triggered, the tendency to personalize, to cling on things, and uh, um, uh, because we want other people to recognize our workload, our, um, you know, busy life. And that recognition, you know, often comforts people. <clears throat> But we can get addicted to that, to that recognition, recognition for our suffering. So the first is, if we recognize the, the involuntary, the unavoidable suffering um, early on, then um, the insecure feeling needing other people's attention, needing other people's recognition to recognize um, our pain, okay, will be minimum, will be minimum. So the tendency to personalize come from insecure feeling. Because in the world we have to share limited resources with many people within a, country, within a nation or internationally or within a family with an um, um, uncertain future, you know, we, um, we feel insecure. <clears throat> When we feel insecure, it's very easy to um, personalize, to, um, to cling to something that we know, and to resist change, and then to subconsciously top up the pain, the pain that is unavoidable. The top up is avoidable. The top up itself is a void. So it's in dealing with suffering that we um, we talk about the other the other poisons, starting from anxiety 
to agitation, to aversion, to anger, and to hatred. These are uh, different degrees of uh, anger or destructive emotion, which is the second fire. The second fire. It creates a lot of uh, um, unnecessary stress and pressure on the mind, on the body. When we feel insecure, insecure because people have not recognized our standing in the society, or maybe are in, insecure, we feel insecure um, whenever we think about uncertainty of life. Or sometimes we just want to be recognized that we do better than other people. So we start accumulating. Greed is the last, sometimes is considered to be the first. But here today I talk about it as the last, the last poison. We feel secure when we, when we own something. It may be, um, you know, a false sense of um, security. But that's what we go for. And usually we, we do go for things more than we need. We need. And when that becomes habit, what we do is that we, we fancy something that other people have and we don't. At that time, you know, greed becomes a, a real poison. We look beyond our need and we um, get carried away by our want and we'll never be able to fulfill our want. But our need is possible to fulfill. So you can see that the three signs, they are quite interrelated. And the three poisons also interrelated. By seeing one of the signs, you may see the other two. By see, for example, in the first sermon, <clears throat> the Buddha just explained to the five ascetics. Okay, who ran away from him just before his enlightenment. They were with him, as you remember, for many years. <clears throat> um, but just before his enlightenment, because <clears throat> he decided to give up the ascetic practices. So they were all disappointed and, and they left him, as I explained yesterday. But with compassion, and also compassion means, you know, focus, accepting and focusing on, on suffering, on dukkha all the time, so that your heart becomes um, shaken with compassion, that you are, <clears throat> um, you are moved, you are so moved, you are so moved that you, um, just think about what you can do to help other people. So that compassion. With that compassion, the Buddha went to um, the five ascetics and, and he gave the first sermon. Uh, I talk about this tomorrow as well. 
But one thing that I'd like to point to you related to today's lecture is that <clears throat> in that first sermon, the Buddha only talks about one of the three, one of the three, the three signs. He only talks about suffering. If we examine the text as it is, as we have it in our hand now, he didn't talk about non-self, he didn't talk about impermanence. But um, after the, the monks, after they understood suffering, the insight, okay, the, uh, the insight that they got was expressed in terms of understanding, impermanence, understanding change. They express whatever arises, passes away, whatever comes, goes. So by observing suffering, they understand uh, the law of change, the law of impermanence. <clears throat> With that, they were able to reduce the effect of the three poisons. And then they continue to practice for a few more days, uh, looking at the habit of clinging. Clinging, looking for something uh, secure. If not now, maybe next life, what would happen to me after, my, after, my, after I die? So they want to to have something, something um, to, to hang on to, um, to comfort them so that they feel secure. So the Buddha um, finally you know, worked work with them on that point, that the second sermon and they all became enlightened. I think I stop here. If you have any question, I would be happy to entertain them. Hello, Marlon. Hi, thank you, Bante. That was really great. We're just waiting for any questions to come in through the chat. Uh, someone asks, um, what can we do? to uh, help uh, small children who are suffering? Mm. Um, <clears throat> the first thing is to comfort them, to give them reassurance. Uh, in words, um, or through um, sympathetic look, um, and and um, to to try to find out okay why they are suffering what they are suffering from without being judgmental okay we, we if we just focus on that pain on their pain and then um, we will see. There are things that we can do. <clears throat> we have maybe sympathetic learning. Sometimes it's not learning. Um, I like to. Um, I like to refer to you one of the the book that I have read recently. It's called the Whole Brain Child. Now, how they use um, latest neurological research and also mindfulness to help children. There's um, one of the 12 strategies they, they, they have in that book is called uh, connect and redirect. Connect means you need to connect with the child, the child's pain, the child's suffering, and then to help the child to really connect with uh, with that 
um, with that suffering. Otherwise, if the pain, if the suffering <clears throat> uh, is not is not managed mindfully, it will remain as a trauma. So, in order to deal with that uh, trauma, uh, it's important um, <clears throat> that the child, okay, is able to make sense of that suffering. In that book, the child, um, well, in in the in the first chapter, the child in question hasn't learned how to speak. I mean, he's he's still quite young. And he had an accident, so that um, the mother, the mother who is very um, informed, well informed neurologically and also mindfulness, would help you know her son, okay, to reconnect with the incident, and then to redirect his attention, the child's attention, to something else. So there are a lot of things uh, that we we can do to help. The first thing is, of course, to accept suffering, to accept the pain, to accept the problem. First, we who would like to, um, to help, okay, we need to, um, to connect, to stay connected with the pain and also our emotional reaction <clears throat> so that we don't get um, bogged down, okay, by our own emotional reaction. Uh, that's one thing. The second thing is, of course, you know, to to help the child to connect with the with the pain, so that so that we we can move on. I also like to um, <clears throat> refer refer uh, you know you to another book. Uh, is the biography of uh, Professor James Doty from James Doty, D-O-T-Y, um, from Stanford University, a neurosurgeon. That's about his life, because he came from uh, a troubled background. And um, he didn't have enough to eat, and his parents were quarreling. Uh, his father was um, alcoholic. His mother was, uh, I mean, she had a big uh, health problem. So, growing up, he looked at the world as uh, something, as a place, you know, full of injustice, and everyone, everyone, okay, he he sees that um, um, everyone having enough in their life. You know, he sees them as uh, as as um, as something to feel bitter about. So he grew up with that bitterness. Then, after at at the age of thirteen, after he practiced meditation, he accepted that it's okay to have suffering, it's okay to have problem. And out of that, I mean, from there, from, from, from that time on, onward, he also started recognizing his potential. So you can see accepting suffering actually calm your mind down and that help you to see your potential. Um, James Doty is uh, you can you can Google it. His book is on the internet. It's about the brain, and and yeah. Um, the title of the book is is called Into the Magic Shop. Into the magic, the magic shop. Yeah, that's uh, another question, please. Thank you, Bante. Um. I have a question here that asks, is there a Buddhist parallel to the psychological concept of the subconscious? Mm. <clears throat> um, we, we don't have the direct translation of subconscious. <clears throat> but we have a lot of 
um, explanation that can be considered as explanation of subconscious mind. <clears throat> subconscious mind. Um, we we talk about three levels of uh, negative emotion. One, <clears throat> the first one is um, uh, manifestation. You know that. And the emotion that becomes manifested either through action or through words that one level the next level is called um, <clears throat> uh, active active uh, consciousness this active is different from the manifestation level is active in the mind but it has not manifested outside. The third one is latent or, or dormant defilement. So, um, um, when we talk about this, we are, when we talk about meditation or training the mind, we talk about the need, okay, to actually get into the dormant level of of the uh, of the mind of, of the consciousness, so um, <clears throat> that's quite similar to to subconscious mind. In that, what we talk about is habits, <clears throat> habits. So it's about changing habit. It's about a belief in Buddhism that we can change our habit. So we return to change and changeability as something being positive. Okay, I'm not sure if I answered your question. Thank you. Thank you, Vante. Um, I have a question here, which asks, um, how can we use uh, the teachings on the three poisons to combat addiction? Um, we, we need to start with mindfulness. Um, using mindfulness to recognize the pain. <clears throat> um, if we don't see okay addiction as pain, pain because that addiction is pain in itself. It um, dictates us um, to go for something. Maybe uh, internet. Maybe. Um, um, alcohol, maybe, maybe gossip, um, maybe, maybe drug. You see, or I mean, any kind of any kind of addiction. So that addiction, it can be recognized if, if we recognize it with mindfulness. Okay, now the, this urge, this strong urge, is is addiction. That mindfulness, okay, is the beginning. With that, to use a, a very Buddhist term, uh, if we can um, reflect on that as pain, wow, this is causing me pain. It's just so difficult to resist this urge. So once you have reflected on that as pain, just briefly, then just turn your mind to something else. Um, <clears throat> I like to refer to I like to refer you to two books. Um, I don't remember the name of the author of, of one book. It's called Mindful Mindfulness for Addiction. Mindfulness for Addiction. That's that's one book. It's a very good book. Uh, it's written by a psychiatrist in America. <clears throat> You can Google that, it's, it's quite easy. The other book is called The Mind and the Brain, uh, written by Professor Jeffrey Schwartz um, from UCLA Medical School in America. Uh, published in 2002, he used mindfulness to replace okay, uh, behavior therapy in psychology. 
you know when people have um, obsessive and compulsive disorder um, in line with addiction not exactly the same but um, the same direction um, he believed that behavior therapy is so cruel so he wanted to replace that and he used mindfulness to um, in, in his research. So the mind and the brain, this is about neuroplasticity, uh, published in 2002, 18 years ago. Um, so I think this book is also relevant for addiction, managing addiction. Thank you. Thank you, Bhante. Um, I have a question here that uh, asks, how can you accept a situation without losing the ability to change it? For example, how do you accept an illness without losing the desire to fight, uh, to change and recover from it? You have to stay with your breathing. You have to stay with your breathing. I repeat again three times, you have to stay with your breathing. Uh, if your mind is calm, okay, the insular part of the brain will work. Okay, in that moment, the executive brain is active. Okay, uh, losing the will to, to fight, that is the right part of the brain, the emotional part of the brain. So those two, two sides of the prefrontal cortex, they don't work at the same time. Um, in Buddhist term, um, if, you stay, if you can stay with your breathing, maybe for three minutes, it doesn't matter whatever um, the disease you are suffering from. If you can stay with your breathing for three minutes, I mean, uh, your mind will still wander during the three minutes, it's okay. Expect that, expect that your mind will wander. Okay, but try to stay with breathing. If you can stay with breathing, even for one minute, in that moment, okay, you will not lose hope. The, the tendency to lose hope, okay, will not overtake you. It will, it will come from time to time. But the executive brain, the insula, the um, ACC, that is anterior singular cortex of the brain uh, associated with mindfulness uh, is, is, about, is about calm and confidence. It's about seeing things positive. It's about seeing things positive. When we lose hope, that's because we can't connect with anything positive in our life because of this pain. Because of this pain. Um, <clears throat> um, I think uh, oh, four months ago, four months ago, uh, four and a half months ago, I was talking to uh, the carer and the sufferer of, of cancers, a okay, cancer patient in Rangoon. I showed them um, some video clip from Canada, um, people who, who meditate, who use mindfulness to calm down, to stay with breathing. They say they handle the automatic thoughts a lot better automatic thought, you know, the, the subconscious worry. They deal with that a lot better. And in general, two more hours of sleep, meaning better sleep. This is 10 minutes meditation, okay? For two hours of sleep, <laughs> I think um, it's worth, it's worth worth investing but um it's better that you keep in touch with uh, other people who suffer from the same thing
Okay, we may have one or two more questions, if you have. Thank you. Um, I have a question here, who, uh, which asks, uh, what if someone is addicted to meditation? Would this oh. be a positive addiction? Thank you. <clears throat> um, I like to use, uh, I like to recall what I have written years ago, maybe in 1998 or 99. Um, I talk about practicing meditation and living meditation. Um, if you say practicing meditation in terms of uh, sitting in silence, um, is possible that that we lose balance in life, that we ignore other things. The heart of the Buddha's teaching is to engage with suffering, suffering within ourselves, suffering in our life, and also suffering in other people's life, because if we just look at something in our life, we tend to personalize it. And we tend to run away. We, we like to run away from it. Okay. Um, a lot of experienced meditation teacher, when they guide you in meditation, uh, they wouldn't want you to, to stay for too long in that um, total, um, um, a calm and concentrated state. They want you to use that concentration as an instrument to focus on suffering, to vo focus on the <clears throat> our habitual, um, you know, our, our habitual reaction to suffering. Because liberation from suffering doesn't come from concentration. It comes from uh, concentration plus understanding plus compassion. So um, I think um, living meditation means to listen to people who are in pain, to share with their pain, now, this can be a form of meditation. So I would call it living meditation. Practicing meditation is to, to gain some stamina so that we can do the living meditation. Um, uh, <clears throat> uh, I don't answer your question in the paraphrasing, okay? I, I don't say yes and no. But I'm describing this scenario <clears throat> that um, in meditation practice, there are times that we feel good enough with our concentration, with our calmness, we, we feel satisfied with that. But an experienced meditation teacher wouldn't want you to stay there. Thank you, Bhante. Um, do we have time for one more question? Okay, sure, sure, sure. Uh, so how can, someone asks, how can I deal with negative criticism? Thank you. Mm. <clears throat> I use uh, one phrase yesterday, that is attention and attitude. So I like to bring that back. Uh, to answer your question. Attention. <clears throat> attention is not just attention of our emotional response, but attention of the reality in the world, in the whole world. Okay, I like to, I like to recite one phrase in Pali, uh, that is in the commentary, it says, Nati loki anintito. There is no one who has never been criticized in the world. There's no one. Holy people, they get criticized. Leaders, 
popular people, they get criticized as well. <clears throat> so, um, the first is to be mindful of, to, to pay attention to this fact, fact of life. And the second, to change our attitude. Change our attitude that um, it's not possible for us to, um, to be correct all the time. And it's not possible for other people to be correct all the time. So in this case, I really like the, uh, the English expression of the benefit of doubt. Give yourself the benefit of doubt. Give other people the benefit of doubt. If you do that, I think um, when somebody criticizes us negatively, we give the benefit that all oh, this person may be correct. And we give attention to that. We give attention and we examine. If that person turns out not to be correct, okay, um, to be not factual, then we have to accept that, okay, people can make 